You are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's case is about the kidnapped women held in the basement baby factory. When a repeat offender sparks suspicion in the neighborhood, how did six girls remain in captivity for months? Then, when they survived, it was speculated that they weren't all victims at all. I also want to thank our sponsor, Magellan TV. You guys know I love their documentary streaming service, but when I was watching last night, it was actually called Lady Killers by Martina Cole, and it goes into detail on six different female serial killers, which I feel like are not talked about at all, or at least not as often as males. And there were a few that I had never even heard about before. There was Beverly Elit and Mary Ann Cotton, but each killer got almost an hour on their, you know, upbringing and their crimes. And so it made this documentary almost like six hours long, but it was in little chunks so you could actually consume it pretty easily. And so I really loved it and it was crazy entertaining. So if you want to watch that or many more like it, go to try.magellantv.com slash Brooke McKenna and you will get a free trial of one month free. So just click that link down below and thank you to Magellan for sponsoring this video. If you don't know, it is my absolute passion to tell these stories. I mean, no harm or disrespect when I do so. So if that's something that you would like to support me in doing, all you have to do is make Make sure you are subscribed with the post notification bell on giving this video a thumbs up and leave me a nice comment down below now let's get back to the story So it was 1986 in Philadelphia and Josefina Rivera was a 25 year old who actually had three children. Now she was working as a sex worker at this time and was struggling to make money but also struggling with her drug addiction. Now her children had been placed in temporary foster care and the judge had told her if she got back on her feet, if she got clean, that she could get them back. So she was working towards this. She was staying off of drugs but in order to make money she did continue being a sex worker. And then on November 5th of 1986, Josefina went out that night after having a fight with her boyfriend because she had to work. So she was out, you know, doing her usual business, but she never came home. It appeared as though she simply vanished. She didn't come home the next morning. And unfortunately, as a black woman working as a sex worker, there was little hope that anyone was going to look for her. That is exactly what happened because this woman was not really looked for at all and she was not found. And then almost a month later on December 3rd, another woman disappeared in that area. This was 24 year old Sandra Lindsay who went by Sandy and she was actually living in the Elwin Institute for Rehabilitative Services services and workshops, basically a place where those who couldn't really take care of themselves could go to get help with just all of the types of things that you need to do while living. She also went to church services regularly. She was super religious. And even though Sandy's mother, Janet, whom she was very close to, asked investigators to go and search for her daughter because she knew she was not a runaway, they once again said that they weren't going to do that because she too was a young black woman and this time she appeared to be a runaway as well. Janet then received a letter which was allegedly from her daughter Sandy coming from New York. Now this said that Sandy had basically gone there and was going to come back in a little bit and for her not to worry. This was in Sandy's handwriting, but Janet knew it wasn't from her. A little while later, a Christmas card came in the mail to her mother with $5 inside. Janet took this to investigators saying, I know this is not my daughter. And they said that that was actually proof she was a runaway. So they definitely weren't going to look. Two disappearances might have been a coincidence, but the community was going to have a hard time believing that when a third woman would disappear. Now, Lisa Thomas was a little younger than the other two at 19 years old. In only 20 days after Sandra's abduction, the second victim, Lisa, was gone. She had actually been walking with a friend who witnessed all of this. And they were walking just down the street as friends and this man pulled up and believed that they were sex workers. Lisa got really angry with this man and the assumption, but then the driver apologized and offered them a ride to her friend's home where they were going. And so they got in the car, which was a white Cadillac, and they 
drove to this friend's home. Now, Lisa did turn to the driver and say, you know, if you want to give me a ride home, I'm actually only going to be at my friend's house for a little bit longer. So the driver actually stayed and waited for her. And then the friend stayed at her home and Lisa got back in the car. After that, she was never seen again. A few weeks later, on January 2nd of the next year, which was 1987, Deborah Dudley vanished as well. She was 23 years old. Not much was known about how she was taken or anything about her really. But then only 16 days later, on January 18th, 18-year-old 18 Jackie Askins vanished as well. This was the youngest woman who had been abducted. Five women, all from the same area, all black women who had vanished, and yet this was not huge media news. This was not looked into by investigators, and it really wasn't on anybody's radar besides their families. This was pointing to a possible MO of a killer, but no one was even searching for the girls and definitely not a killer. Even though no one but their families were keeping track of the possible victims going missing around this time, looking back, it did appear as though there was a two month period after the last victim that nobody was going missing, especially not women who were under the same MO. However, this unfortunately was not the end. On March 24th, Agnes Adams was working as a sex worker at 24. She went out that night and she too did not make it home. Six women with unknown whereabouts, yet there was no panic, no media outcry, and certainly no help. What these women were enduring was worse than their family's worst nightmares. You see, the first victim, who was Josephina, had gone with a man while working as a sex worker and he brought her back to his home. Now that is where he paid her and offered to take her to McDonald's once they were done. And once they left the restaurant, the man actually told her that they were gonna go back to his house. Her being a sex worker figured that they were going to do business again and she was going to get paid again. So she went and didn't provide any sort of fuss. As they went inside his home the second time, Josephina noticed that his key was quite strange. The jagged end of the key was missing and he just put the head into the lock and twisted it. And when she asked him about this, he said that he broke it off in the lock so that nobody else could get into his home. So it was only him with the head of this key. Once back inside, she kind of got a closer look of the home. She was looking around, being more cautious, and that's when she noticed even more strange things. There were pennies glued to the walls as well as dollar bills. Josephina went with this man to conduct more business, and when they were done, she quickly realized she was in trouble. As she put back on her clothes, this man began strangling her from behind, and when she was begging him to stop, he wouldn't. Basically, she was unconscious, and by the time she woke up, she was landing at the bottom of the stairs in a dark basement. Her wrists were bound together, and her chains were basically super glued together as they were put on her legs as she sat on a dirty mattress. Guy, honey, picked me up at 2nd and Gerard um, the day before Thanksgiving of 86. And um, he took me to his house. We went upstairs and um, we had sex. And afterwards, I was getting dressed and he came up behind me and started choking me. And um, he started choking me. But I, all I could remember was, I don't know, I guess it happened so fast, all I could remember was like a film projector of things that were going on in my life was like, you know, just flipping back. When I came to, um, he had a handcuff on my, on my, on my arm, on my wrist, and um, he kept saying, um, shut up, keep still, I ain't gonna hurt you, I'm not gonna hurt you. Then he took um, muffler clamps and put the muffler clamps around my ankles with this chain and then he used crazy glue to hold the nuts on and he dried it with a hair dryer. He left and a while later he came back with drilling equipment. He began talking to Josefina as he created this hole in the floor and the abductor was calmly explaining to her that he wanted to grow his family 
and that's why she was there. The abductor came back day after day to work on his hole and make it deeper into the ground, and Josefina was left screaming for help. I mean, no one heard her because there was actually a radio blaring upstairs that had hard rock music on, but then one day when he was gone, she actually noticed this very small window. She decided to try to go over to it. She could reach it. However, it was so small she could not get out of it, so she ended up just leaning out and screaming, but once again, nobody heard her, or at least nobody came to her rescue. Josefina was counting the hours she was alone, and it was just getting worse and worse the longer that she was, but after about a month of being in captivity, when her abductor hadn't come to see her in 24 hours, she hadn't gotten food, water, or anything in a complete day, she then got a visit from him, but the basement door opened and she was suddenly not the only woman. Another girl was thrown down the stairs next to her, and this was Sandy, who had also been abducted, and this was from the Institute where she was, you know, going to get help. Sandy was actually abducted from the Institute she was living in, but she had also just gotten an abortion after falling pregnant. That night, they were both sexually assaulted, and the man went back to working on his hole as well. While in the freezing cold, they were kept nude, they were starved, they were dehydrated, and they quickly found comfort in each other from huddling to keep warm. But little did they know, there would soon be another woman joining them. Lisa, the one who had disappeared after going to her friend's house and getting back in the car with the man, actually ended up going to Sears with him because he had invited her on a vacation and she said, that's fine, but I don't have any clothes. So they went to Sears, bought some clothes, and then he took her back to his house where he then sexually assaulted her after she was knocked out from a drug that he put in her drink. The man then tried to strangle her and he bound her wrist before throwing her into the basement just like the others. His third victim and no one was even close to being on his tail. When Deborah was abducted by this man, she ended up being in the worst condition of all when she got there because she put up quite the fight. She fought the hardest, she had quite an attitude that angered him and so he had beaten her before even getting her down a stairs. But Jackie's abduction was pretty much the same as everybody else's, yet the abductor needed to come up with a different way to keep her locked up because she was so small that these shackles that he was using for everybody else's legs just slipped right off of hers. He ended up having to put handcuffs around her feet to keep her locked up. These women were only given a portable toilet and wet wipes in order to bathe. As the pit got larger and to the ground, the women were forced inside and there was lots of debris placed over the hole so that they couldn't escape. Now, most days they were actually forced to eat dog food in order to survive. But with five victims that this man had abducted, he began changing his routine. And soon enough, he was forcing the women to have sex with one another while he watched. And when they weren't having sex with each other, they were chained about 30 paces apart so he could walk between them and do what he wanted. The comfort and safety these women felt with each other quickly turned to anger. They were pitted against each other. Their abductor had done that to them because every time he left, he assigned one woman basically the role of being the watchdog. And so anytime somebody did anything wrong, they had to tell him. And the problem was they couldn't just say everyone did fine because if everyone did fine, they would all be beaten instead. But not only beaten, at one point he decided to electrocute the women. So he would fill this hole up with water, get wires, and throw them into the pit. But one woman decided to use this man's plan to pit them against each other to her advantage. She decided that after nearly three months in horrific condition, she was going to do something different to survive. This was Josefina, his first victim, and she began to act excited every time he wanted her to be in charge. She was saying that she wanted to be in his home, she wanted to be a part of the group, and that she was his friend that could help him. She knew that this man was beginning to trust her when for her birthday, he brought her back Chinese food and champagne for everyone to eat. Unfortunately, this didn't mean that the horrors would end though because two of these victims would not be making it out alive. Meanwhile, the woman's families were distraught with the lack of help. Sandy's mother, Janet, actually believed she knew who had abducted her daughter. She said that there was a man who lived nearby who was always kind of hanging around at the Institute and Sandy was often visited by him. She had his name and she had his address. This was 
3520 North Marshall Street, yet investigators refused to search the home or talk to the owner. They claimed that they didn't have probable cause to enter the home, and so the families were quickly coming to the realization that they may never see their daughters alive again. Almost five months after the first victim was abducted, Josephina, everything would be revealed. You see, an investigation was never started, but they would need to do so quickly because on March 24th of 1987, Josephina would turn up at the gas station and call 911. When officers arrived, they listened to her story and they didn't believe her. She had to pull up her pants to show where the shackles had been gripping her legs so that they would listen to her. That's when she gave them the address of the home she'd been staying at, saying that there were still three women there, but that meant only four out of the six missing. Investigators knew that there was much more to an abduction at that point, and they knew that murder had occurred. This man was a killer, and this man lived at 3520 North Marshall Street, the very home Sandy's mother had warned them about. Josephina claimed that their abductor had said that he wanted to have kids and lots of kids, that he already had kids, but the state kept taking them off of him. And so he was making a way of having kids that nobody could take from him. And he told Josephina that she was the start, that she was going to have his baby down there. And then he was also going to get 10 girls in total to all have his kids. She was almost relieved hearing this at first because she believed that he wanted to kill her and now she was needed to have babies. After months of torture, Josefina had felt helpless like the rest of them, and as they multiplied, she decided that it was only going to get worse unless she did something. Their abductor had actually realized that the woman could hear him coming downstairs or when he was leaving the home, and so he decided to shove screwdrivers in their ears to deafen them. Josefina then watched two women die in front of her. She knew she had to do something different so she didn't end up like them. The first was Deborah Dudley. Deborah had disobeyed their abductor and had been punished by electrocution in the water pit and she didn't make it out alive. He used to fill um, the hole up with water and take electrical wire well, like a plug that you plug in, he would take two, strip the two wires, and then um, he would take the wire while they're in the water and put it on their chains. And in the beginning, Deborah was, was hollering, and then she didn't holler anymore, and he thought something was wrong with the wire. I said, look, look down there in that hole and see what's wrong with that girl. I said, because he kept saying, she keeps saying Deborah dead, that she lay face down in the water. So he finally listens up the board, and he says, yeah, she is laying face down in the water. And he just like picks her up like by her hair, back of her head and something. He's like, yeah, he's right, she's dead. And now he's like, now all my troubles are over with. Now I can get back to having a peaceful basement. Then Sandy was found trying to remove the planks and the debris from the top of the hole in order to escape. And the man ended up beating her and hanging her from one wrist by a handcuff from the ceiling. And she was left for days without food or water, and when the man finally came down to release her for her punishment, she slumped onto the floor, already deceased. He then realized she was actually pregnant and said what a waste of a baby while trying to shove bread into her mouth to revive her. He proceeded to kick Sandy's body at this point, but that wasn't even the worst part. You see, at this point, the man forced the other girls to help him dismember Sandy. Now, Jackie was forced to cut off her arms, but everyone had a piece in the dismemberment, a task, so they could all be part of the murder. Sandy's body was then blended and cooked and served to the dogs as well as the girls. It was said that the odor was consuming a smell that they will never forget. It caused Sandra to go on punishment for all these days, you know, and um, he had her handcuffed like to the ceiling beams, like for, for a couple of days and she wouldn't eat and stuff. And he didn't, um, and he was trying to make her eat. And he was like putting, she was putting bread in her mouth. Because when you got on punishment, first he would just give you water, then he would give you bread and water. And then you like, I don't know, I guess like he would take away all your privileges and then you'd have to start all over again, you know? Our whole body just fell. And she was just like, the only thing that was holding her up was just the handcuff, you know? 
And I kept saying, Lisa, go over there and tap Sandra and see what's, and tell her, you know, see what's wrong with her because her whole body was collapsed. And she kept tapping her and tapping her and Sandra didn't move, you know. So he just puts the key in the handcuff and her whole body falls and her back of her head hits the, 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 the concrete on the, well, like the hole, the surrounding of the hole, his, the back of her head like hits the corner of this hole. And um, he's like, she's dead. You know, she's dead. And it like really had me so messed up because Sandra had been there with me from the beginning, you know. He like untakes her chain off and stuff and you know, he takes her upstairs. He got Sandra's head cooking in a pot upstairs, right? And he got her ribs and stuff in a little roasting pan in the oven, you know, and her arms and stuff is in the freezer. And he says that if I don't cut out my bullshit, that I, this is going to be me. However, Josefina was getting the least amount of punishment at this time after becoming his friend. She realized that he was lonely. That's why he wanted all of these babies. And so she began to be his partner. After a few weeks of this, Josefina was going out on shopping trips with him, going to eat with him, and proving her loyalty by never screaming or running away. She said she had no idea what she was doing, but she was just praying to God for guidance. And the day before Josefina's escape, her abductor had taken her out to bury Deborah, and also to abduct another victim. That's when they found Agnes Adams together. You see, Gary was actually a customer of hers and Josefina was a coworker. And together they found her. After choosing her, Josefina asked if she could go and visit her family or at least talk to them. She said she would bring him back another wife. So the next day he agreed that she could call them. That is when he drove to a gas station, dropped her off and she ran. When she was talking to investigators, she said that her abductor had claimed that if he was ever caught, he would say he was insane and that he had even done it before because he had been qualifying for disability payments for years, even though he didn't need them. Not only was Sandy's mother correct about the address and the man who had abducted her daughter, but she wasn't the only one who had suspicion about this man. You see, some of his neighbors had called the police due to the smell many times. Now, when the police went to his home, he said that he actually fell asleep while cooking and he had burnt a roast and that was causing the smell. Now this officer believed him and left without looking inside, but if he would have, if he would have just gone down to the basement, he would have found girls being held captive in a pit. When investigators arrived at this home, they found some of Sandy's remains in the freezer labeled dog food. There was also a note written by Josefina that said she helped punish and kill Deborah. I, Josefina Rivera and Gary Heinick, um, Electrocuted Deborah Dudley at 3520 North Marshall Street on whatever day it was. I can't remember. It might have been, let me see, it was free on the 25th. It might have been like the 21st of March, 1987, by applying wires, applying electricity to her chains while sitting in a pool of water. Josefina claimed that he was going to use this against her and blame her for the murder, but she only did it because she was trying to get him to trust her. Jackie, Agnes, and Lisa were all still alive when they arrived at the home and they were taken to the hospital to get some examinations. And Lisa told the officers that Gary would often pretend to be an officer himself and come downstairs to save them and then beat them if they had screamed. Now, do you remember when I told you that Sandy, the woman living in the Institute, had gotten an abortion and had been pregnant before being abducted? Well, it was then found that before she was abducted, while she was still at the Institute, Gary had visited her and gotten her pregnant. That was his baby. And she had the abortion, but then when he found out that she had been pregnant, he offered her money to have another one of his children. She did decline and he then forced her to comply. But at the same time that Gary was being arrested, his best friend, Sorrel Brown was too. Sorrel was actually admitting to witnessing Sandy's murder and her dismemberment. And he was released on bail after agreeing to testify against Gary. Not long after he was in custody, 
see Gary actually tried to take his life, but he survived. Now, Gary was this 43-year-old who had been born on November 22nd, 1943 in Ohio. His parents were said to be divorced when he was young. He went with his mother for a while and then went to live with his father. He had a brother named Terry, and he said that both of the boys had been emotionally abused by their father and that he often wet the bed and his father would put the sheets that were stained up in the window for the neighbors to see, embarrassing him. He said he had lifelong problems with bedwetting after that. And as a young child around three years old, he had actually fallen out of a tree and it was so hard that it had misshapen his head, which he got bullied for. But many say that this could be the reason why he was so unstable. During school, he had no friends. He once told a person who was asking him if he got the homework done that she was not worthy to talk to him. And basically he screamed at her to go away. He was also incredibly smart though. He had an IQ of 148, but he dropped out of school early and he joined the army at 17. He was known to do a great job. He trained as a medic. At 24 years prior to the abductions, he was on a military base when he began to have these severe headaches, dizziness, blurred vision, and nausea. He was actually diagnosed with gastroenteritis or infectious diarrhea and schizoid personality disorder, which is the coldness or unemotional view of the world and inability to form attachment. He was discharged from the army for this and he went on to become a nurse, but he was fired soon after for his rude behavior and never showing up. Now, 17 years prior to the abductions, his mother actually died of suicide after suffering from bone cancer and alcoholism. Gary was spending quite a bit of time before that and after this in mental institutions, the same as his brother, Terry, and they both attempted to take their own lives multiple times. This is when Gary created the United Church of the Ministries of God. He opened an investment account, which after a while had what would be almost $2 million today in it. Now this church would have meetings in his home and these meetings even were happening when the girls were in his basement. But going back to his past, in 1976, he actually shot one of his tenants in the face. However, it just grazed him and he was charged with aggravated assault and carrying an unlicensed gun. His first abduction would come two years later but this wasn't one of the girls in his basement that we talked about before. You see, his first real victim was Alberta, the sister of his then girlfriend named Anjanette Davidson, whom he had a child with. Alberta was her sister who lived in a mental institution and Gary took her out one day only to not return her and lock her in a storage room in his basement. The institution actually went to search for her at his home and got a police warrant, but Gary said she wasn't there. And the second time that they searched, they found her and Gary was then arrested. Now, Alberta had been sexually assaulted and contracted an STI. Since Alberta couldn't testify, the more serious charges were dropped in that case and Gary was sentenced to only five years in a mental institution. At his parole hearing, he was asked a question to which he responded by writing on a paper that the devil put a cookie in his throat and he couldn't answer. Released three years prior to the basement abductions. This was even though the judge said there was a high probability that he would commit more crimes against women and that if he could keep him in custody longer, he would have. Gary then met a woman named Betty Disto who lived in the Philippines and they got together and were married in 1985. However, Gary was still sleeping with other women and began beating and sexually assaulting Betty and she ended up leaving him and filed a police report for assault and spousal rape. She had gotten pregnant with their son, but chose not to let Gary know about this. The judge then ordered Gary to stay away from Betty, and Gary had three children in total by this time, all that he was not allowed to see. And then next year, the basement baby factory idea came into his head, and then he unfortunately made it a reality. Gary's brother, Terry's daughter, actually said that their whole family was screwed up and weird and that Gary was beaten really badly with a tour airplane when he was a kid because he would pee his pants and that their parents had given those kids serious problems. Another one of Gary's friends said that when he was in the army, he was actually given LSD and had a nervous breakdown where he decided not to come out of it and to basically fake it for a long time so he would get disability. Now that Gary was in custody, he was saying that those girls in his basement had lived there before he had moved in two years ago. Neighbors said that he was an oddball, but they didn't think he was capable of this gruesome evil, yet some of them had even suspected Gary, saying that he often lured these women into his home 
and that some of the victims of Gary weren't just the victims in his basement. They were also victims that he would lure into his home and then let go, and they were called his spiritual wives. He would tell them all he was a brother bishop of his church and that they should come for religious services. They believed he was their God and was the only one who understood them, and he said that he served them and protected them. Now the court needed to determine whether he was fit to stand trial, and the defense wanted him to be able to plead insanity, but the prosecution fought this by saying that he had actually gotten so much money and investments for his church, meaning that he was an investor and not insane. His financial advisor even testified that he knew exactly what he was doing, and the church was found not to be a tax scam either. They were actually holding services, and the people who came continued to ask if they were going to have any services once he was in custody. The defense then began blaming Josephina as a last-ditch effort and blamed the murders on her. However, this backfired because the judge said that if Gary could enlist the help from Josephina, then he wasn't insane. His defense attorney said when he first met Gary, he did believe he was insane, but he was trying to figure out whether it was insane or just evil. Gary had told him that he wanted to create the right race of youngsters because he believed that the world was evil. So they were going to have a race of babies with a white dad and a black mom, and he was going to keep them away from the world and just have them learn from his teachings. He wanted to have a perfect race, according to him, of children right. from these women. His lawyer said he firmly believed in his faith. He firmly believed he was going to get out of this evil world and into the subsequent. He was not petrified of being executed. He wasn't afraid of loss of life, not in the slightest degree. I was conscious enough to know that was a conscious act on my part, and that was essentially the reason. To drown out that noise, for sure. Well, they might like a little entertainment, too, you know. At first, I tried to make it nice, right? Yeah, how, how did you do that, Gary? Uh, I was holding parties there for one thing. They go down in the hole in the morning, board goes over the top of the hole with the sandbags, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then they stay down there till roughly about eight at night. Nothing was working. I was trying to find something that worked that would make them shut up to stop so you know, I could grasp some it. kind of infliction of pain on these women. I was trying to find something that would make them behave. But it was painful to them. I hope so. You know, that's what I was trying to achieve, you know, to make them behave. If I was a torturer, why would I have waited so long to start a torture? The, the, the torture and the pains didn't start until uh, really after January 29th. I'm sitting there, you know, trying to figure out what the hell to do, you know? What the f to do, you know? Huh? I started chopping up the body. I dismembered the body and, and I, I, you know, started burning it on the stove. I consciously knew I was trying to hide the evidence. Gary's father then came forward after he hadn't seen his son in 20 years and said, I hope to hell they hang him for what he did, and you can quote me on that. I'll even pull the rope. The survivors did testify against Gary, and Jackie took the stand, and she began sobbing as she talked about the deaths of Deborah and Sandy. And photographers began bombarding her, and she actually screamed at them because she was so scared, and that is when the judge banned cameras from the courtroom, saying that they were insensitive. Gary sat the entire trial staring straight straight ahead, and after 16 hours of deliberation, Gary was sentenced to death by lethal injection. Gary's family began fighting for his sentence to be commuted to life, and his ex-wife, Betty, even wanted a stay of execution due to him not being competent enough to be executed. This was in court two years, but never went anywhere, and he was actually executed on July 3rd, 1999. Jackie attended the execution, saying that it was far too calm, and that Gary didn't even ignore acknowledge them or say sorry or anything, and it didn't bring her any satisfaction. Josephina refused to go, saying that he would have suffered more in a cell. He was the third and last person in Pennsylvania to be executed. After this, all four of the women got $30,000 settlements for what they had gone through, although no amount of money can make up for that. Sandy's mother, Janet, said that if investigators had listened to her from the beginning, Sandy would still be alive today. Even though justice had been served, Jackie, Agnes, and Lisa didn't believe so because they blamed Josephina for what she had done inside that home. They wanted to press charges against her saying that she had done more torture than what was needed of her. 
and that even if she wanted to be his friend, she didn't have to do so much. Jackie said that she was the one who killed Deborah because she placed the wires into the pit of water. They believed they all could have gotten out alive if it wasn't for Josephina. They all looked at her as the protector at first because she was the oldest, she had been there the longest, and they quickly had to realize that wasn't going to happen. Jackie believed that Josephina took on her serial killer ideal too. So they really wanted her to be punished. However, the DA thought otherwise and believed that she had helped them and that helping with the torture was what got her free and saved all of the women in the end. Yet even though Josefina wasn't charged, these allegations from her fellow victims changed her life once again and she actually went back to drugs and sex work for quite a while and she was having financial struggles. She really did no interviews because the media were basically painting her as Gary's accomplice so she didn't want to talk to anybody. But 28 years after her abduction, she spoke for the first time. It was 2014 and Josephina did an interview where she talked about how now when she passes workmen digging up the road, it will send her into a really bad place. And if she sees a screwdriver or a chain, it causes her to go into a depressive episode that can last for months. Years after she had survived, Josephina realized that she kept trying to go back to the place where she was before the abduction, the person she was, and she realized that that was no longer possible. She now works as a waitress and has quit sex work altogether and is drug free. And she is a 53 year old grandmother now living in New Jersey with her husband, Chris. She loves walks on the beach and collecting sea glass and basically just a more peaceful life. And she has overcome so much of her panic attacks and fear. Josephina says that you don't totally get over an experience like hers, but you do learn to live with it. She just wants to inspire other victims to have a positive outlook for the future and she has actually published a book called Stellar Girl. The other victim, Jackie, now lives in Philadelphia and loves her adult sons, hangs out with him all the time and works as a house cleaner. Jackie cannot enter basements to this day though and has intense flashbacks that made her have to go on some medication. He was the main one who blamed Josefina for much of the torture and the deaths and she finally agreed after like 30 years to sit down with Josefina and really talk to her about what happened and after they talked it through Jackie realized that Josefina didn't do it because she wanted to and Jackie even admitted that Josefina's plan was the best plan that could have occurred because they're here now. Now the infamous scary movie, The Silence of the Lambs with Killer Buffalo Bill was actually inspired by six different killers, but one being Gary. Yet he, and most importantly his victims, are much less known than other serial killers. Do you believe Gary was actually insane or was it all an act? Did his fall from a tree as a kid cause him to have this frontal lobe damage which made him lack empathy? Or was it his childhood that he claimed was abusive? Did he really want to make babies down there? Or did he just want these women for himself? None of the girls were pregnant besides possibly Sandy, but we'll never know. Also, do you believe that Josefina was anything but a victim herself? I have many questions about this case, but I am very, very happy that four of the girls were saved before none of them remained alive. I think that if Josefina hadn't gotten away, they most likely would have never been found. So I think that she is a hero more than anything in this story and that what she did and having to deal with that torture afterwards, you know, the torture she inflicted was enough of a punishment for her, even if she did help. She now has to live with the fact that she did that. And, you know, I think in order to do that to survive, she was one brave, strong woman. But don't ever forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye.